so how, when we think about people with IBS, how can they better regulate the connection between their brain and gut? I think a big part of it is, so there's a system within our brain that's called the salience network, mm -hmm. which um, you know, constantly monitors external things in the environment and internal things like sensations and signals from the body. Um, and it evaluates them in terms of are they threatening to the homeostasis of, of our body? And when, when they are threatening, a red light goes off and um, then, then the brain responds, you know, with an autonomic response or pain response or, um, and does something to, to reestablish balance. Mm -hmm. In IBS patients, that salient system is overreactive. You know, it, it's not, it's not, accurate, it's, um, it's fidelity, is, it's biased, um, and the alarm bells go off way too often. So one thing is to learn, first to understand that, and secondly then to learn, and this is really where cognitive behavioral therapy comes in, to learn to adjust, to, to normalize that salience assessment. Because once that system is balanced, then all the downstream systems like the emotional arousal and the you know, the sensory motor and the central autonomic networks all fall into place. Mm -hmm. This may take a while because if you have, you know, lived for 30 years with a wrong uh, warning system within your brain, then it doesn't change overnight. Mm -hmm. but, um, but, but it can change fairly quickly. I mean, we see this, you know, with face-to-face um, -face cognitive behavioral therapy, always when I talk to my colleague, uh, Jeff Lackner, in their studies, you know, even after three or four sessions, some people have significant symptom improvement, mm -hmm. which means this is, can be changed fairly quickly. You know, it's like, it's like a dial on a computer that you could change. Um, you don't have to rebuild the computer. It's, it's uh, uh, in some people, it's so deeply ingrained that it, you know, may be very difficult to change. Mm -hmm. uh, and there may be other factors, but so um, realizing that how our body reacts is to a large degree influenced by how our brain reacts mm -hmm. unconsciously to all the things around us. Uh, <clears throat> and then training with exposure and, uh, you know, realization that what triggers it and then rather than avoiding these situations, exposing yourself to the situations, which are generally innocuous, they're not that dangerous for the body, um, that that will, you know, change the whole uh, makeup. So that's one thing. Mm -hmm. Another thing that we already talked about in terms of um, self-efficacy, so rather than falling into this pattern, I have to see my doctor and you know, and this kind of thing is so reinforced by the advertisements every night on, on, on TV that they show a new pill and say, ask your doctor if you can take this, ask your doctor. So my recommendation is the less you need to ask your doctor, the better. You know, you, it's all inside of you. You have that knowledge too. Um, you just need the strategies that you would get with something like a CBT course um, to utilize your own wisdom. I mean, your doctor doesn't know that really. You, you, your doctor knows the side effects of the latest medication, but not what goes on in your brain or, you know, in your brain gut axis. So that's another thing. Um, and applying this, for example, to what kind of things you can eat, your, your diet. So you should cust customize, personalize your diet. That is good for you, minimizes symptoms, and not go with a, <clears throat> with a generalized recommendation, all the things you can't eat, you know, it's, uh, some other examples. Um, I mean, talk about the exposure, which is a big part, um, any avoidance of situations obviously creates more anxiety or makes anxiety more chronic. So when, if you expose yourself to a situation that you were afraid of, and you realize nothing happens, if you do this a few times, you will no longer be afraid of that situation and you won't, your brain won't trigger the alarm bells. 
Can you talk a little bit about some of the ways, common ways IBS is currently treated and whether or not it differs depending on the type of IBS a person has? You know, this again has gone through different phases in the last 35 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so it went from fiber and some, you know, anxiety, lowering medications to uh, an attempt by industry. And, and so we were involved heavily in this to develop brain gut targeted medications that affect the brain and the gut. And unfortunately that approach failed. Nothing really came out of that, that without side effects. Mm -hmm. um, even though some of the approaches were promising. And then the pharmaceutical industry decided they, they're gonna just focus on the gut. Mm -hmm. So they, they just treat constipation and diarrhea. And, um, you know, they have been relatively successful in that. So we have now medications that uh, stimulate either water secretion in your colon, mm -hmm. enhancing, you know, the likelihood of a bowel movement or slow down contractions. And uh, so these are basically motility and secretory drugs. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, because you need it for FDA approval, they did additional studies where they then showed that this is also good for your abdominal pain. Mm -hmm. um, how good these data are for, uh, in terms of the pain that remains to be determined. I mean, you could make the argument, you know, hypertension is a, is a sort of a disease that we treat with centrally acting medications that relax with muscle and um, affect heart function, even though it's ultimately also driven by the, by the brain. Um, and um, I mean, hypertension is, is, is also a brain, you know, brain cardiovascular disease. It's pretty clear they just have not really it's not been recognized as such, but, um, and we have some pretty good antihypertensive medications that don't affect the brain, but just, you know, dilate blood vessels. So somebody could make that argument for IBS. We don't really need to deal with the brain. We just normalize bowel movements and that will decrease anxiety. And, and, and that's where we are right now, you know, so this is really the situation right now. Mm -hmm. Well, then when you think about it, you know, if these medications are several out there now, if they were so effective, why do we see, still see so many, so many, I mean, the prevalence of IBS has not gone down, you know, we've not, not really made a dent on how many people experience the symptoms. Mm -hmm. if, if those medications were so successful, then, you know, we would, we would have seen that. But. So, you know, that leads me to cognitive behavioral therapy. And, you know, I'm wondering how, how can CBT, you know, help people reduce their symptom severity? You touched on it a little bit, but would love to hear an expansion on that. Yeah, so before going into the mechanisms, you know, so following up on what we said earlier about medications, mm -hmm. there's clearly, and I do this in my own practice, a space, significant space for combining certain medications with CBT. Mm -hmm. So I would say 90% of my patients, I would use that model. Mm -hmm. And I personally use these low-dose tricyclic antidepressants, which don't work like antidepressants, so they have no effect on, mm -hmm. on mood. Quite honestly, we don't know exactly why they are effective in control studies. Um, but somehow the concept has always been they normalize these brain-gut interactions in, by unknown mechanisms because they act with multiple receptors and systems. So I, I would always, always combine the, the low dose tricyclics in a personalized dose with, with the CBT. So we have done studies and it's a couple of others that have shown that they change the interactions of certain relevant brain systems with each other. So they normalize interaction of the salient system with the emotional arousal and the executive cognitive system. Mm -hmm. um, and probably with, you know, brain uh, nuclei within the brainstem. So they clearly have a direct, both functional, but we've also seen structural effects that mm -hmm. rewire some of these connections. Um, and that just speaks for the plasticity of the brain, you know, that is able to adapt to once you reorient it, 
how to how to function properly it, it will do that it will not continue with the old pattern mm -hmm. um, and then there's there's also downstream effects of that so it's not like you know because of the brain gut axis so when you apply cognitive behavioral therapy to the brain you normalize the circuits in the brain mm -hmm. you will also see effects at the gut level you know in terms of bowel movement frequency but even even on the microbiome, on on, on microbial um, abundances and and metabolites, so okay. that brain targeted therapy will have effects indirectly through the brain gut axis on the gut as well. So you treat both at the same time. So in summary, you know a a reprogramming of um, circuits within the brain, reprogramming of the brain gut axis and gut function. Um, and often that these processes are assisted by medications. So if somebody had like severe diarrhea, you know, I would, I would probably add something to that. So decrease that severe anxiety of being incontinent. This is a small fraction of, 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 of patients, but if you've been incontinent in the car or before a meeting, um, that fear is so ingrained in you that um, initially CBT alone may not be able to help you get mm -hmm. over this. So, but CBT plus, you know, something like Imodium taking before an event or before you get on the freeway mm -hmm. um, may be helpful. And so you have to custom tailor this combination therapy for, for everybody. Everybody has suffers from depression. Mm -hmm. You know, and a small percentage of uh, IBS patients um, have a, a DSM-4 diagnosis of, of depression. Um, or if you suffer from severe anxiety, um, that patient may also benefit from a, a full-dose antidepressant, a, a, a SSRI, um, which I also do, you know, in those patients that have these comorbidities. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I definitely appreciate the the personalization of it and kind of customizing the treatment for people. It's not a one size fits all. So in my practice, the majority of patients, I would write their prescription for having this online CBT. It's not, I don't see it as a third line therapy mm -hmm. because I mean, this is quintessential IBS, you know, to have this, this overactive salient system. It's, it's, it's not just the most severe cases have it. And um, um, so, yeah, I, and my prediction will be in the future that this will become the standard. I mean, I, I just cannot, I could not imagine a situation that a therapy like this would, would not become the mainstay mm -hmm. therapy, you know, mm -hmm. baseline therapy. So. Mm -hmm. Just like I see the low-dose tricyclic antidepressants, that for me is a baseline therapy. It's not for most severe patients. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.